Not from Leicester, not from Kettering, and not from Northampton. Live from Market Harbour, this is 95.1 HFM. HFM weather in association with the new South Leicestershire Learning Innovation Centre. New location, new ways of learning, new experience for you. For more information, telephone free on 0800 731 6723. Good morning, this is HFM Interactive and I'm David Wortley. Today's weather is going to be cloudy with outbreaks of rain and showers. We'll have a little bit of sunshine later on in the day with the showers slowly dying out. Maximum temperature 13 degrees centigrade to 15 degrees centigrade. David Wortley on HFM. Good morning, everybody. It's HFM Interactive, the radio with picture show. We've got a great show lined up for you this Monday with more guests than ever before. Just a reminder about what HFM Interactive is about. It's a breakfast radio chat show. I'm going to be talking to guests from around the world and in the studio here. It's a virtual meeting place, bringing people together locally and globally. It's a combination of radio and pictures. While you're listening to this broadcast, you could also be logged on to www.hcln.net forward slash HFM to join the program. It's an international conference. We've got experts from all parts of the globe sharing their wisdom with us. It's a journey into the information society. We're going to be looking at what life is going to be like in this brave new millennium. And it's a world first for Harbour. So, what is the background to this? Well, the inspiration behind all of this is a man called Thomas Cook living in Harbour in 1841 when he had the inspiration which changed the nature of the travel industry. The communication revolution of the 1840s, yesterday's railway network was rather like today's internet. The same sort of phenomena was happening in the 1840s as is happening today. And what Thomas Cook did was he took this new network technology, he made it affordable and accessible. He gave it a mass appeal and he changed the shape of travel as we know it. You may remember from last week and the week before, we've got a little snippet from the Thomas Cook story each week, so stay listening because you could win a prize. And today's bit of information is to do with Thomas Cook's first tour abroad. It was a tour to the Universal Exhibition in Paris in 1855 and I'll read from the book. In 1855 Thomas Cook organized his first conducted excursion to Europe which commenced on July the 4th. Make a note of that date July the 4th 1855. The occasion was the Universal Exhibition in Paris but his tours were to include other places including Germany. The tour carried the option of an extension to Germany and about 30 people headed by Thomas Cook himself visited Aix-la-Chapelle, Cologne where they sailed on the Rhine to Coblenz, Mayence, Frankfurt and Heidelberg. So remember that date July the 4th 1855 Thomas Cook's first excursion to Europe. We're broadcasting to you live from Innovation House. This is a new centre for the South Leicestershire Learning and Innovation Centre. It's a community media and lifelong learning centre. We're up here on the top floor broadcasting to you live. Whilst you're listening to this program on air, you could also be logged on to www.hcln.net forward slash HFM and you can interact with our guests from around the globe. We've got prizes for you. We've got a Back to the Future e-certificate for every person who registers for this program. We've got one worthy winner in the studio with us here today who's certainly earned his e-certificate by logging on each morning to the program and interacting with our special guests. We've got prizes for the first phone-in question. I think that's already been won by Andy Morris out there at Thurnby Lodge. If you're listening to this program, Andy, thanks for your call last week. Plenty of opportunity to call again. We've got prizes for the first text question. We've got prizes for the oldest and the youngest people logging in. We've got the Thomas Cook Quiz Prize. We've got prizes for people logging on from furthest away and prizes for the best and most innovative uses of information, communications, technology. So, if you have any questions doing this program, Dial 0800 917 2617. Speak to us now. Give us your experiences of technology. 
If you happen to miss this programme, you can always call the station at any time on 01858 464 666. So we're looking at the way in which information communications technology is going to shape our future. We're covering an enormous range of topics during this series of 15 programmes. We've had some great success. A lot of people have been logging onto our site. When I checked on the statistics last night, so far, up until June the 8th, we've had 42,000 hits on the site. And if you're logged on to www.hcln.net forward slash HFM, you'll see the statistics for the site. And it's interesting how the statistics have changed between May and June. In May, we were getting a lot of hits from the USA. The majority of people logging onto this program were from the USA. Now it's shifting slightly. USA has dropped from 72% down to 52%, and other countries are increasing in proportion. We've been all around the globe so far. If you logged onto this program, you'll see a world map with little red dots on it for the places that we've been to so far. The furthest location is the Arctic Circle, where George Lessard logged onto the very first program using his satellite telephone connected via a satellite link to northern Canada. He joined the program on its very first occasion. We've had lots of tour highlights. I'm going to run through these in, in detail. We've had some fantastic people on the show, some very interesting stories from people like Paula Draper talking about her Silent Wings video, Bob Bridges talking about his filming with Harry Potter and with Superman. We've had Raymond Swamy from Finland talking about his research into the railways. We've had people talking about kids radio, Phil Solo here in the studio and Ken Young over in Melbourne. We've had Milda Hedblom talking about the World Summit for the Information Society in Geneva. And we've had Nancy White talking about facilitation and group processes. So today's program is very packed indeed. If we can get out all our connections, we're going to be talking to a lot of people this morning. So we'll be giving each person about five minutes worth of interview time. We're going to start in the studio here very shortly with Ben Crosley. He's come all the way over from Fleckney to be with us here this morning. We're great, very grateful. Good to see you in the studio, uh, Ben. Uh, we're then going to uh, go down to TAME in Oxfordshire. I'm going to be talking to Carol Stephen, who is Chief Executive of the Foundation for Water Research. And then we'll be flying over to Bombay, or Mumbai, as it is now known, to speak with Jayati Parika. Uh, she's at the Indi Indira Gandhi uh, Centre and she's going to be talking to us there from, from Mumbai. We hope also to go to Bangladesh and speak with Partha Pratim Sarkar over there in Bangladesh. We've got Alan Potkin on the line from Laos. We just hope that his uh, telephone connection stays up long enough for us to be able to speak to him. Uh, we're hoping at some point perhaps to go to uh, Malaysia to speak to Halamatun Khalid um, who's a professor there at the uh, University in Sarawak in Malaysia. And then finally we're going to all the way over to Canada to speak with Terry Willard, who's waiting for us on the line in Calgary. So we've got a great program. Remember, the telephone hotline 0800 917 2617. Okay. So, whilst I'm giving the audience a little bit of a polling question, uh, checking their responses, I'm just going to play you a little bit of Pink Floyd. <laughs> No dark sarcasm in the classroom Teach and leave them kids alone 
Today we're going to be talking about ICT and sustainability. And we're going to be asking ourselves a number of questions. What do we mean by sustainability? What, what are the, the areas of discussion for today? How can we use information communication technology to conserve natural resources? And how can we manage commercial sustainability through ICT? We've all been through the dot-com revolution. What are the implications of all of these things for a global society? So, what do we mean by sustainability? Well, sustainability means a lot of things to different people. Environmental sustainability, looking at things like deforestation, we're looking at things like pollution, we're looking at the effects on the developments in our society on natural resources like water, we're looking at the ozone layer and we're looking at the way in which we're using up fossil fuels. Can information communication technology help us in those areas? But it's not just environmental sustainability, we're also looking at commercial sustainability. We're seeing businesses spring up and die more rapidly than ever before in the history of man. We used to start a job thinking in terms of a job for life. That's what a career was. Today that no longer applies. And if you're in business and you've been lived through the last 20 years having your own business as I have, you've seen changes in things like customer loyalty. Whereas once upon a time, if you looked after a customer well, you could be assured that that was a customer for life. Now you no longer can guarantee that because we're swayed by new attractions and new prices. So we're looking at the longevity of relationships when we look at sustainability. And we're also looking at the sustainability of society as itself. If you're looking at www.hcln.net forward slash HFM, you'll see a picture of an H-bomb explosion. Does the human race have a future? Will information communication technology assure our future or will it bring us to a rapid end? So how can we use information communication technology to conserve resources? Well, we use a lot of resources, natural fossil fuels in travel. Maybe things like teleworking, things like virtual conferencing, things like the program we're doing today where we share knowledge without having to travel. Maybe those are the kind of things we can use to conserve resources. We can use computers to improve the productivity of the work that we do and save on the resources that we're using doing it. We can use EICT for innovation. Will that be enough? If you're a teleworker, we'd really like to hear from you. So if you're sitting at home there and you're a teleworker and you've got the opportunity to log on, log on now to www.hcln.net forward slash HFM and tell us your thoughts. Or dial in on 0800 917 2617. We want to hear from you teleworkers. So, how to use ICT to manage commercial sustainability? It's all about building, managing relationships, developing partnerships, it's understanding what customers want and making sure that you look after them properly. It's customer relationship management. But it's also a culture of recognizing our mutual dependence on each other. So how is it all this going to shape global society? Are we in for a peaceful future with shared wealth in society or are we looking forward to a period of conflict and a divided society with one half of the world being rich and the other half being poor? Well we've got a lot of expertise around the globe to share their thoughts with us today. So, moving on now, just a reminder, if you've got any questions, or if you're a teleworker out there, dial in 0800 917 2617. So, on with the programme. Well, Claire, our Madewell Sheepwalks lady, um, she's travelling back from Ireland. Uh, she ho Hopefully she will be with us on the programme tomorrow. So we're going to straight on to our studio guest. In the studio here, we've got Ben Crosley. Good morning to you, Ben. Good morning, David. Nice to see you in the uh, body. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I thought you were going to say in the flesh then for a minute. You give people the wrong idea, Ben. Yeah, so, so you travel in from, uh, from where, Ben? From Fleckney. You You'll be pleased to know we're on the same time zone as Market Harbour. Absolutely. Well, I'm sorry about that from your point of view, because I, I know we dragged you out of bed early, but I, I also know that's not a problem for you, because you've, you've joined in the, the programmes uh, so far. You've been a regular 
regular listener. Yes, I've not missed a, a programme that I could possibly could, yeah. except for the Jubilee when we went down to London. Oh, so you were down in London for the Jubilee? Were, were, you, were, were you celebrating in the Mall then? Yes, we were. Well, Trafalgar Square, yeah, we didn't quite get into the Mall, no. but uh, the children enjoyed it. Yeah, so it was a really good... Uh, Wonderful Bicycle atmosphere. Yeah, yes, yeah. So, how have you uh, found the uh, the HFM interactive programme so far? You enjoyed them? I've found it very enjoyable and very enlightening. Um, as you know, I'm, I'm interested. Was interested from Telstar, and uh, this is every bit as interesting as Telstar, and far, seems far more successful than uh, that was initially. And Telstar's had an enormous impact on society, and I think programmes like this will. Well, that's great, Ben. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased. I, I, your your cheque will be in the post. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Ben, well, we've got your picture up on the screen and a little picture of the uh, the map of uh, Leicestershire. What, I, what I'm going to do now, Ben, is, is just load up uh, your profile so that everybody can um, get an idea of a bit about uh, your background and the, uh, the things that uh, you're involved in. Um, I, I first came across you, uh, I think, from the, uh, from the Foxton School website. Do you want to tell us a bit, a bit about how you got involved in that? Yes, uh, I'm a parent governor at Foxton School and um, because there are so many children from out of catchment and the governors tend to come from out of catchment, we really started to use the internet, email and the web page to communicate first of all between the governors and we're extending that and the children are beginning to produce their own pages for it now. But it's very much a tool for parents and governors initially. Yes, and uh, you did a lot of the development work on the Foxton School site, I believe. Yes, that's right. Um, I did it as a pilot to see whether it would be effective and uh, important. Uh, and now we're finding it very useful for promoting the school travel plan, which is to create sustainable travel within the yes. school environment. Yes, yes, I'm, I, yes, I'm, that, that's, a, that's a very good point, Ben. You, you're uh, feeding me with the right lines, because I'm going to now um, uh, load up the web page for everyone. Uh, this will be appearing in a separate browser window for our uh, guests around the globe. Um, and it's about your Let's Go to Work uh, uh, project. You Tell us about that, Ben. Yes, that was started by a letter in the local uh, newspaper, Harborough newspaper, from um, a, a somebody who wanted to get a car share lift to Gruby every day. Um, and I contacted him and said, why don't you uh, do something on the internet? And he said, that's a good idea, let's do it. So we, we created this between us. And we, I think that car sharing, lift sharing, is an important first step to sustainable travel. With school travel plans, we tend to be trying to make the women and children go first in giving up cars. And I think it's important that everyday commuters doing, going to businesses uh, should also make an effort. Car sharing is an easy thing to do because you do it when you want to, when it's convenient. Yeah. You don't need to stop using a car, which is practically the only method of getting around in a uh, place like Harbour District. Yes. Um, but it's a f it faces you in the direction of sustainability. If it became widely enough used, it would make an enormous difference to the traffic on the roads. Yes. At a time when it's important, at uh, commuting times. A absolutely right. Right, I'm fascinated by your use of the uh, the internet, Ben, because um, uh, you've been pretty innovative, but um, designing web pages is not your profession, is it? No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you do for a living? I'm an accident investigator, actually. For oh, a road right. accident investigator yeah. for the uh, local authority. Yes, yeah, yeah. So I see the cost of transport not only from the point of view of the user but from the point of view of society generally, yes. the cost of accidents. Yes, yes. Um, there's some quite innovative things on your website. I just want to do, uh, I've just loaded this on the screen for everyone. Um, you've got um, uh, an option here to download a car sticker. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you have to print it yourself, I'm afraid. Because um, car sharing, lift sharing and doing it through the internet because it's so cheap and easy to do it through the internet. We're not a multi-million pound venture. It's a low cost, no cost idea. Yes. Uh, and therefore, um, 
we don't have money for promotion and things like that and that would probably mean that we're less successful than we might be but if you want to let download a sticker and print it on your own printer we'd be very pleased but most of all we want you to get out there and start lift sharing absolutely and, and you've also got um, uh, uh, an option on your page here to email this page to friends who benefit by car sharing as well mm -hmm. yes yeah we depend on uh, word of mouth to uh, pass the pass the news around about car sharing. It needn't be done through uh, through our database, but it's obviously better if it is because we can provide up. We would provide up to ten possible lift share people. Yes. And then it's up to the individuals to get in touch in a safe environment and to make arrangements for a trial period. Yes. It's so useful. I I can't think of any disbenefits of car sharing. Yes. Uh, the only th benefits I can think of are for the individuals in, in saving money and um, from uh, for society in saving pollution the benefits are for everyone and and have you had uh, many takers for for this scheme Ben? we haven't had enough we've had a few from harbour and we've been successful we um, promoted it through the the um, harbour council so uh, that was helpful but it really needs to take off in a location and to be self-generating once it reaches a certain point uh, there'll be so many, enough people car sharing to make it a, a solid network like the internet yes yeah, and uh, presumably if um, other people who are logged on to this program think this would be a good idea for um, their area to set up something similar, you'd be willing to share your expertise with Certainly, them. yes. I think yeah. it's important that we try and maintain a single database because one of the problems is large companies can quite easily generate a, uh, a database of car sharers within their own company but it excludes small companies on industrial estates like the one we're sitting in now yes. where there may not be the communication from one factory to another across the road yeah. with a small number of staff well that's what we're hoping for with uh, with HFM Interactive it, it is a medium that does reach out to a lot of people I know we've got a lot of factories uh, listening into this program because we get regular calls with uh, requests for re records so if you are listening there and you, uh, you are interested in the car sharing concept. I can put you in a man in, in touch with a man who'll be able to help. Okay, Ben. Well, thanks very much for uh, joining us this morning. I'm just going to uh, uh, just play a little bit of uh, one of your uh, your songs. It's uh, Telstar by the Tornadoes. Thank you, David. Just a little snippet of uh, Telstar by the Tornadoes for our studio guest here, uh, Ben Crossley. We're now moving over a little bit further away in the UK to Tame in Oxfordshire, where we should have uh, Carol Stephen on the line. Are you there, Carol? Yeah, hi, David. Good uh, morning. Good morning to you. How are you this morning? Okay. Well, <laughs> mornings are not my best of times, but I'm all right. <laughs> good. Well, we've, as you probably see on your screen, we've got a picture of you and uh, some of the pictures that, uh, that you're enjoying at the moment, a picture of your uh, studio there in Oxfordshire and, yeah. uh, and your two uh, special doggy friends. Yeah. Yeah, well, they're, they're all here listening. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just hope that they, uh, they're, they're not, they're, they don't start barking, which is their usual reaction when I, uh, when well, I come over and see you. <laughs> no, you. You're all right this morning. We've debarked them. Oh, have you debarked them? Well, I hope we didn't involve, involve any cruel to the, no. to the animals. <laughs> OK, Carol, well, I'm, I'm just um, loading up your profile up onto the uh, computer screen, so if uh, anyone logged on to this programme, you'll be able to get a picture of uh, Carol and a few of the things that she's involved in. So, um, can you start, Carol, by just telling me a bit about um, your your job at Foundation for Water Research? Yeah, Foundation for Water Research has been set up for all oh, since about 1989. It's um, 
had to move with the times like so many things it started life by um funding research into um water and it's now moved away from that into the information world i i believe quite strongly that there is an awful lot of research out there which many of us many of us around the world have contributed to either financially or through our expertise but it's not research which is commonly known about in other words it's written up it probably provides a thesis uh, for a student or it wins a prize and then it's just put up on the shelf so my company now is looking more at bringing the results of research um, into everybody's world so at least that they know about it. So what you're saying is that all of this uh, valuable knowledge is is largely locked away and, and inaccessible and what you're doing now is you're effectively uh, providing the key to unlock that information and uh, make sure that it's shared between the right people. That, that, that's right. I mean, you know, one can't do it overnight and there will be some research that is probably buried for a long, long time but at least Hopefully we can now go forward and collect a lot of the research up as it is, as it is completed um, and see that through the internet and other medium, people know about it. I mean, that's the wonderful thing about ICT now, isn't it? Yes, yes. So you're publishing uh, the results of this research on, on the internet and, and also on other media like, uh, like CD-ROM. Uh, that, that's right. And we, we try and pick up as much information as we can and put it on our web pages. And I also believe that you are very much involved with, on an international level with, uh, with other uh, organisations around the world. Do you want to say a bit about that? Yeah, we are um, slowly um, getting ourselves better known in so much as we have um, information uh, arrangements with the Water Research Commission in South Africa. That's in Pretoria. Um, we have arrangements with the um, Water Research Association Foundation in America. We have um, arrangements with the Water Services Association in Australia. So that, that that's just a, a few organizations around the world and it's beginning to work. But yeah. it, uh, say it can't happen overnight. Uh, absolutely. And of course, uh, when we come to talk about preserving uh, resources, it's also making better, best use of our human resources as well. Uh, spending money on duplicating research is obviously not the most efficient way of doing things, is it? No, it isn't. And I, I think you have to also understand the word research, because sometimes research um, involves proving that something doesn't work. And I think it's equally important that people know that. Yes. So they know that people have tried to do this before and it hasn't worked because. So at least that way they start halfway up the path if they want to reopen that issue. What what um what kind of a future do you think we're, we're facing? And you, and your expertise uh, at FWI is mainly in, involved in in water as a natural resource. Um, are, are we in danger of uh, ruining our water resources if we're not careful? Uh, I don't think. I, I think that's probably more of a global issue, in so much as if you live in Australia or parts of South Africa, you really value your water, so you're, you're likely to take a lot more care of it. I think in the UK, all right, apart from the old dry summer, we make a big scene about it, but in the UK we, we don't actually have a water problem, or at least we're not aware that we have. Yes. So I think we value it less, and, um, and I think there is more of a danger where we don't value things highly that we're, we're more likely to ruin it. Uh, uh, absolutely. So our danger, I suppose, in the UK then is, is one of complacency. We, we're in a fortunate position, but uh, we don't quite appreciate how fortunate we are. I, I, I think that's right. Could I just ask you a little bit about um, uh, teleworking? Because you, you've got an office set up there uh, in your own home. Do you, do you find that a valuable way of, of operating? Yes, I think it is, although 
although I, I, I think um, perhaps in the water industry around the UK, um, we've got quite a long way to go to get everybody all in on the same system. Yes. I, I find often my colleagues overseas are far more advanced. Yes. Um, and, and that's a good thing. It's, I, I would like to see more people in the UK setting themselves up like this so that they can take advantage of this sort of thing. Yes. So this morning is wonderful. Yes, yeah. But not too many people pro probably have um, the resources or are lucky enough, as I am, to be able to do this sort of thing. No, that's, that's right. Well, we had a caller on uh, from Thurnby Lodge in, in Leicester um, on Friday, and he was a disabled person on low income, and he was making the point that um, the internet service providers want three months up front, payment up front from, from him, uh, and a credit card, neither of which he has. So he's, he's forced to just using the technology to send emails by... By, by mobile phone, which of course is uh, very expensive. That, that, and, and also, David, I think there needs to be, well, I, to everybody that's listening, it, it's important that they know that I, I'm backed up by you and you've helped me tremendously. I mean, you can't just suddenly wake up one morning and say, hey, I'm going to join this lot. You, you, you do need expertise. Yes. Uh, it sounds as if there's going to be another check in the post, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's very important thing for people well, to understand. Well, I'm, yeah. bound, I'm bound to agree with you, Carol. Uh, Carol, we, we, we've got a, a very tight programme this yeah, morning, sure. so I've got to move on yeah, to move on. our next um, uh, our next uh, guest, who's over there in, in Vienna. Thanks very much for your time. And, uh, uh, are we going to use a chance to question people? I mean, I, I've got a question I'd like to ask Ben Crosby sometime. Well, yeah, please, uh, ask him now. He's here. Yeah, what, what is your question? Uh, but ben, just a, just a very quick question on your car sharing. Um, do you have a problem with insurance? Um, I mean, if, if you're going to pack quite a number of people in the car, does the driver have to carry any special insurance? Yeah, uh, Carol's just asking if you've got any problems with insurance. Do you need special insurance if you're car sharing? Um, no, insurance companies will permit car sharing, um, and a small allow a small payment is allowable, providing it doesn't generate a profit. But it's best if the person that's car sharing does check with their insurance company, as with any uh, change of use. Okay. Okay. Yeah. The, the only other question I've going to suggest was that does you have a problem with people? I mean, you've obviously all got to meet up somewhere to get in this car. And is there a problem there with car theft if you've driven to join the main car? Um, what uh, Carol was saying is that uh, if you're car sharing, uh, presumably you, you gather together in, 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 in one place. Uh, um, have you any problems with car theft with people leaving the cars once they get in the shared car? No, the person I car share with, we take in turns picking each other up from home. The idea of uh, our, with the way our car share works is that we organise it so that people are very local to each other, both where they pick up and where they set down, so that it's just a case of dropping people off one way and then dropping them off on another, in the other direction, uh -huh. and parking in the usual place. There's no change to, to the normal usage. Yeah. Okay. I, I think this is my, my one big worry when it comes to saving money on, by using public transport or even car sharing is it, the crime element. Yes, yeah. Okay, Carol. Th thanks so much for joining thanks. us this morning. I, I have to move on now to yes, sure. uh, to uh, Vienna, where we've got um, Herbert uh, Raup. We should have Herbert with us. Herbert, yes. are you there? Yes, I am listening all the time. So oh. Thank you very much. Good morning to you, and <laughs> how morning. are you? Thank you very much. Okay. And how's, was... how's the weather f with you in, uh, in Vienna? Well, it's, it's cloudy and... Uh, got to be rainy today as it looks like <laughs> so <laughs> okay Herbert well we've got a packed program this morning so yes. we need to move on very quickly I think yes. to give uh, time to our other guests um, can you just tell us a little bit about um, the work that you do with um, uh, the European Association for Promotion of Sustainable Development yes so uh, we were founded some and a, one and a half years ago as a, as a group of um, research people, uh, academics, university people, who got together and said, uh, obviously it looks as if we couldn't go on like this. If we take seriously what the natural scientists and the ecologists tell us, we already need some sort of two planets of the same size to 
carry on with that kind of economy uh, and uh, more or less still uh, wasting style of uh, using our resources. So um, we are working now in doing uh, diagnosing analysis but also developing programs of how or to what kind of policy we have to get to bring our next generation, our children generation in a sustainable future, this is a future which has a chance of its own. And um, to bring out the main points, uh, first of all, we, we say that um, we, uh, we, are, we are living in a system with an economy which has uh, developed uh, its allocation process and its distribution process, but we have no sense and no instrument for scale. This means we will have to move very soon to an absolute limit of using resources, and all the rest of economy has to adapt to that. Now, there's no consciousness for this. There's still the, the primary vision that if we using capital as a, as a fluid uh, medium, we can just move uh, resources around and they will end up in the best place, which means the best profit. But um, this is going to the expense of nature. Yeah, and so... It, it because says nature in most places does not have its right price. Yeah, yeah. So, in essence, I think it, it really touching on on something that uh, Carol Stephen was uh, mentioning just a few minutes ago um, is that we're, we're I suppose we've been so used to enjoying the benefits of a market economy and seeing our wealth grow that we were in blissful ignorance of the uh, the likely consequences of that. Yes, uh, I myself am a, calling myself now a generalist since I'm coming from social science research doing experiments of all kinds and seeing all the social problems of regionalism and immigration and school, etc. But when they come across these pro problems, you, you get a new sense for, for priority. And um, so, um, but we, we have ended up in the problems which were mentioned before that we cannot solve the ecological problem on its own without at the same time solving the social problem. And uh, what has been mentioned before are m modules uh, to ameliorate uh, our social problem in terms of communication, which your whole program, program now, uh, just right now, is about, but also with car sharing and uh, with uh, water resources, etc. But we, we're going further in the sense that we say we need a new consciousness which will build up a new policy instrument to limit uh, the absolute limit for the use of nature, which is uh, almost cost-free or cheap, and which ends up using the air and soil and water. Now, soil seems to be the next most important uh, very dangerous problem. We are losing on this planet soil in the size of my country, Austria, every year by degradation. Yes. While at the same time the population of the world is growing. Yeah. And, and obviously there's a, there's a, a limit and, and an end point to all of this which um, is going to cause problems for all of us. Yes. Yeah. So exactly. do, you, do you see information communication technology as being the salvation or do you see it as being something that's just accelerating the problem? Um, even so, I've been stressing now this nature problem. We have done in our research group a sensitivity analysis which is, has been developed by Frederick Foster, you probably know. A anyway, this is a, a method where you can cluster to gain uh, some 10 to 20 uh, most important variables, and then you, um, in the group, you evaluate them both with, in terms of how active they are react and uh, giving impulses to other uh, factors of the 20. And after you, you'd gone through the whole procedure, there are some factors coming out as major critical factors where you, we as a human uh, species can be active. And these three factors turned out to be education, as you can imagine, yes. mass media, and global governance. Now, 
Even so, um, Herbert, um, Herbert, yeah, I, yes. Um, I'm, I'm going to be have, having to move on very shortly. Yes, Herbert. yes, yes. Sure. Um, Let so us conclude. We, yes. What, what would be your concluding remarks? Even so, um, the, the most dangerous is, as I mentioned, the soil problem. We ca these are not one we can attack, attack directly. This is moving indirectly. So if we get, by using the active factors, education, mass media, and global governance, in the next uh, 5, 10, 15 years wisely, the others uh, important critical factors will be touched indirectly. So directly is exactly what you are doing now is a major educational effort by uh, distributing information. This is the right way. But we should it on a worldwide scale. And the mass media are the critical point because they are still giving us fun and trash. Yeah, uh, we so and we have to got to go in that direction. So <laughs> this is my conclusion. Okay, thank you very much for joining us, Herbert. So we need more education. We need to create awareness. We need and to get into the mass media, and get not into only the, the schools. Uh, absolutely. Yes. Well, we, we'll, we'll keep trying to do our we, best. Uh, and you, you're doing the best, and a congratulations <laughs> to the programs. And thank you very much. hear you furthermore. Thank you very much, Herbert. Stay with us now, because we're going over to uh, Jyoti Parika, who's been very patiently there waiting for us in Mumbai. Are you there, Jyoti? Yes, hello. I'm Jyoti Parikh from Indira Gandhi Institute of Development Research. Hi, Jyoti. It's, it's fantastic to have you on the program. Um, we had um, a, a professor on the program from Mumbai uh, last Last week, talking about uh, gender issues, um, oh. w would you like to tell us a little bit about uh, your work at the uh, Indira Gandhi? Well, in Indira Gandhi Institute, we have uh, it's an advanced research institute uh, with multidisciplinary focus. So we uh, take a development project a problem and apply whatever discipline is needed to solve that problem. If it's uh, environment and economics and water resource uh, management, then we put all these three disciplines together and so on. We uh, do a lot of networking for getting getting it all right, uh, correct, uh, I mean. And um, uh, we also have teaching and teaching program, uh, and we are... Uh, <coughs> We give uh, only advanced uh, degrees like masters and PhD, and our students are doing very well. And and uh, sustainability is is quite a, yeah, a, a major part of your work. You were mentioning. I wanted to uh, say a slightly different viewpoint. Please. Is that um, the the uh, sustain, societal sustainability requires that, uh, uh, and sustainability is about. Uh, if you look at the Brundtland definition, it's about intergenerational and intragenerational equity. Uh, and we don't have intragenerational means. Today's generation itself is highly inequitable, whether it is uh, between developed and developing countries or between men and women or age and, uh, aged and young and so on. And uh, powerful technology like uh, uh, information technology could... Uh, divide this further or could bridge the gap depending upon how we handle it. So, so uh, I would like to use this technology to bridge the gap between um, gender, gender gap or age gap or, uh, I mean, generation gap or also the between developing and developed countries. So, so what, what you're saying is, picking up on the point that I made earlier, uh, ICT has the potential either to bridge these uh, divides or to make them further apart. That's right, that's right. I agree with that. Well, how, how would you see um, ICT then being used uh, responsibly to uh, bridge those gaps? What can we do? How can we use ICT to make sure that we bridge the gaps? Oh, we have. We should have special programs for the others so that they are not left behind even more than before. Uh, and um, these special programs can uh, make sure that uh, they do some kind of leap, leapfrogging and, and uh, do even better than what what was possible without the IT, uh, which is uh, uh, which would have been a slow way of bridging the gap. Now, uh, let us say if I consider. Uh, 
uh, uh, I'm also working on energy and environment uh, myself. And um, let us say if you are working on a problem of uh, indoor pollution, which I do, uh, which means that people who use in the developing countries like uh, fuel wood or crop residue and, and whatever uh, informal fuels they find to burn in their homes, they suffer from these uh, smoke diseases from smoke. Uh -huh. Now, you could uh, tell them how to avoid uh, by developing some very um, graphical packages. And we find that uh, awareness is the first step uh, to, to uh, avoid these health problems. So you could uh, uh, use them uh, to uh, use this ICT to, uh, you know, uh, for uh, pro uh, awareness of health, about environment, about education, about many other issues. I met this Bangladesh pediatrician. She said that uh, we have uh, completely uh, reduced the... Um, deaths due to water pollution simply by awareness it's not that uh, us doctors who have done it it's the extension people who have told them about uh, how to avoid deaths and despite the a lot of floods and and uh, uh, you know a lot of water resources all over bangladesh uh, we still manage to uh, even after the floods are over uh, you know we still manage to avoid these deaths similarly we could think of uh, such issues in this uh, indoor uh, pollution and uh, uh, and many other health uh, diseases so uh, is it it's a question of, uh, of of education and awareness. It's uh, it's not so much pumping huge sums of money um, into um, technology or projects. It's uh, it's spreading knowledge and spreading awareness in the most cost effective way. Pretty yes, much. That's right. That's right. But then then it would require some investment. Like yes. you need a kiosk, uh, uh, you know, uh, spread all over rural uh, areas uh, where they can uh, access such uh, at least. Uh, one or two monitors should be available where they could be, uh, you know, simple, uh, even w without language kind of uh, packages can explain to them how, how to avoid pollutions in terms of cooking practices, in terms of ventilation, in terms of... I'm just giving this example, but yes. these examples are uh, uh, everywhere in uh, how to uh, grow better food or how to use water wisely or... Uh, how to grow your horticulture co crops and so on. There's a lot of knowledge is needed for productivity, for better livelihoods, better health, and so on. So each uh, uh, um, area you could develop these packages and call them and um, uh, because another thing we found that whenever there was even little literacy of even primary education, the, the disease rates were far lower than total illiteracy. So, so, so ed education is really fundamental to all of this. And I, I know in, um, in Asia there is the Simputa project, which is aimed at providing a, a, uh, a relatively low-cost device, um, which um, has uh, um, built-in speech recognition to be able to address some of those problems. That's right, yes. Um, Giotti, it's fantastic to have you on the program. I'm afraid I'm going to have to move on now because uh, we've got a couple of other guests that we need to fit in before uh, the hour is up. Please stay on the line and there may be an opportunity just to uh, interact with each other before the program finishes. Okay. Thank, thank you me. very much for joining us. That was uh, Giotti Parikh um, over there in Mumbai in India. Uh, well, hopefully mo we're going to move on to uh, Laos now and uh, be talking to Alan Potkin. Alan, are you there? I'm here. Ah, I can hear you, Alan. That's great. Well, yeah, uh, I think this is a better sound. Uh, yeah, I can I can hear you very well. Um, okay, Alan, I've um, um, I've got your picture up on the screen and, and a map of um, roughly uh, where you are. Would you like to describe that for our listeners? Whereabouts you're speaking from? Uh, Vientiane is the capital of Laos. It's about. Uh, uh, 500 kilometers north of Bangkok, uh, maybe uh, 500 kilometers east of uh, of Rangoon, 500 500 kilometers west, 300 kilometers west of Hanoi. So you're sam you're sandwiched in between Thailand and Vietnam, are you? Uh, Thailand, Vietnam, China, and Burma. Yeah, okay, so you're a bit, bit squashed in the middle there. So just tell us about uh, the work that you do, Alan. Well, um, 
my, my background is as an environmental consultant working on water. Um, and more and more I was realizing that uh, the documents that we were publishing, uh, planning documents, uh, resources management documents, environmental assessments, um, were basically impenetrable um, to non-English speakers, pretty impenetrable to English speakers, and uh, were almost useless. Uh, yet the, uh, uh, the consulting world was generating uh, kilograms upon kilograms white paper documents that nobody was reading. Right. So uh, I became interested in how you can make uh, uh, documentation more understandable uh, to non-English speakers, to illiterate people, uh, to decision makers, and how you could use uh, information and communication technology, new media, to essentially publish documentation that would be interesting and compelling so that people would want to look at it and right. read it and you could convey what you're trying to convey. Well, it sounds very much like... Say, uh, out of sight, out of mind, and if you can put something into sight, it's not, it becomes in mind. It sounds very much as if uh, you're, you're, what you're doing is right up uh, Carol, about all of our uh, other guest speech, uh, what Carol was touching about on, on her publishing of information, what Herbert was talking about with his, uh, uh, with his publishing and education, what Jayati was talking about uh, with, uh, with others. It sounds, sounds very much uh, we're, uh, we're all in the same street. Well, I think so. I mean, education is where, you know, is really, uh, uh, but what's, what's happened is that it used to be that the mass media, quote unquote, that was the, uh, the only vehicle that there was. And, and uh, the mass media um, in the capitalist countries became a captive of corporations with co essentially a corporate interest. Um, and in the socialist countries, it became uh, a captive of a different ideological interest. And the point is, with the technology that's available to us all, uh, the, the media is no longer mass. Anybody can uh, can publish, can broadcast, um, can can uh, acquire imaging and, and put imaging out there into the world. So it's uh, it's something new, and uh, uh, the opportunities for a vast diversification of media are just enormous. Uh, absolutely, and um, uh, we're going to be doing a program on Thursday, I think it is, on community publishing tools, which will t touch on this topic in, in more depth. Alan, I'm afraid I'm going to have to move on now, but I'm very grateful to you for joining the program. I hope you found it interesting. Um, if you want to join a, a program later this week, you'll be very welcome. Thank you very much for uh, okay, joining thanks. us, Alan. Uh, we're going to move over now to uh, our final guest, who should be waiting for us there in uh, in Calgary, in um, is in Can is Calgary in Canada. Excuse my ignorance, Terry. Indeed, it is, David. Oh, We're yes. in Western Canada, <laughs> right near the Rocky Mountains. Oh well, it's a beautiful part of the world, and it's one of my uh, one of my dreams, perhaps, to come over to Canada and uh, go skiing there. I, I did go to Van was looking to go to Vancouver one time and went to Whistler Mountain, but it wasn't in the uh, in the skiing season. Um, okay, Terry, I'm I'm sorry that we've only just got a few minutes left before the end of the program. Would you like to tell us about the kind of work that you're involved in? Sure, as I might have mentioned before, if you have the profile up on the screen. I'm, I'm going to bring it on manager. the screen now, yep. Great. I'm a project manager for the International Institute for Sustainable Development, which is a nonprofit that really works on policy research and advice on many areas of sustainable development, including climate change, trade and investment, poverty, natural resource management. But we also have two critical teams that are working on issues of communications and information and communication technology. One is our reporting services group, which produces the Earth Negotiations Bulletin, which anyone working in the field of sustainable development policy and United Nations negotiations knows is a daily record of negotiations dealing with various issues, whether it's climate change or poverty or agenda, that, are, that is produced on a daily basis at these meetings and provided to all delegates and also circulated for free on the web through email, through fax services, trying to make these negotiations much more transparent for people and accountable. Yes. Uh, the second area of work is our knowledge communications team that I work with, which really does action research on how do you change decision-making for sustainability? How do you include more people? How do you reach them? How do we figure that people actually make decisions these days? I think one of the things we've seen with the growth of flow of information and, and boom in information and communication technologies is that people really aren't rational decision-makers. We make decisions for a number of reasons. 
um, and trying to sort through all of that and figure out how to influence various processes. Right, okay, and, and in that context you've been involved uh, fairly recently in a, an ongoing virtual conference or discussion forum, I believe. Correct. I actually wear about three different hats at ISD, um, trying to support a couple of different groups that are using ICTs to promote sustainable development and sustainable alternatives and forging relationships around these. The first group that you mentioned is uh, working to support partnership and alliance managers. Increasingly, we're finding that sustainable development can't be done by any single group alone. It, it requires governments, businesses, and civil society and community groups to work closely together. So I've been managing an e-conference with the United Nations Development Program and Business Action for Sustainable Development, trying to draw out lessons of managing these kinds of partnerships around the world and trying to think uh, in the post-Johannesburg World Summit for Sustainable Development after September, when that occurs, how do we support these kind of partnerships? What do partnership and alliance managers need to know to make these kinds of collaborative efforts more effective? Yes. The, the second group that I've been working with are communication managers at sustainable development organizations, because so many groups around the world have excellent experience, but the mass media isn't carrying their stories. You know, people in Uzbekistan aren't always aware of what's going on in Kazakhstan, let alone what's going on halfway around the world in Mexico that they might be able to learn from or draw upon. So it's been useful trying to get these communication managers working more closely together. Yeah. And it, then the... Sorry, carry on. Yep, the third group, sorry, David, is young people. Increasingly, young people are the real owners and innovators with information and communications technologies. They are also among some of the most active and concerned citizens in the world on issues of sustainable development and social justice in the environment. And when you start bringing their energy and enthusiasm and experience with these technologies together with their concern for the issues, you see some really powerful things happening. Yes, we, we had um, Maya Gopal on <coughs> earlier uh, last week, uh, from Hamburg, um, she's doing a lot of uh, work with young people on sustainable development, and uh, I think I, what I'll do is I'll, um, uh, I'll I'll put you in touch with uh, with Maya because I'm sure she'll find your work extremely valuable. Um, Terry, I'm sorry that we're going to have to cut the program short because we're just about uh, running up to the news time now. But um, in summary, really, there's a lot of education required. ICT using for education for mass media, community publishing tools, young people. All of these have a part to play. Thank you to our guests. Coming to you live from Market Harbour with news from around the world. This is HFN. It's 7 o'clock, I'm Bob Cruz. Benefit scroungers beware. Blair's launching a blitz. The Prime Minister's stepping up the fight against skivers who refuse to take jobs. They could lose their benefits if they turn down work. Reporter at Westminster Owen Thomas says it should go down well with the public. The sort of headlines government clamps down on benefit scroungers always seems to go down with middle England voters. The sort of voters that uh, the government really has to hang on to. But among Labour MPs, especially left-wing Labour MPs, very mixed reactions.